Welcome to this session on Bringing the Margins to the Center, uh, an introduction to social annotation. Uh, I'm here with a couple of folks that I've known for a very long time, um, and I'm very excited to be here with uh, what I believe are two of the foremost experts on social annotation in the world. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, I've known it, uh, Amanda and Allen for a long time now. We connected early in my career um, on the tech side of social annotation because they were both early adopters of social annotation for, for teaching and learning. Um, and so I'm looking forward to your presentations to this and to the discussion that follows. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce you uh, each, um, and then I'm going to provide a little uh, overview introduction, um, and then we'll hear from each of you, and uh, then move to uh, uh, maybe a Q&A and some and some discussion. So Dr. Amanda Lacasero is the Emerging and Digital Literacy Designer at the University of Pennsylvania and a Junior Fellow of the Society of Critical Bibliography. Um, I wonder when the first time digital literacy, uh, emerging and digital literacy designer was used as a job title, but it's an awesome one and I'm glad that it exists. Uh, Amanda is also a pedagogical director of the Book Traces Project, the chair of the Committee on Digital Humanities for the MLA, Modern Language Association, and serves as the editorial collective on the editorial collective of the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy. Uh, Book Traces, uh, which I hope she'll talk about a little today, is uh, something, it's a large scale project to find and record historical readers' interventions in the circulating collections of the University of Virginia Library, focusing on volumes published before 1923. So actual annotations in books. <laughs> um, her research explores the intersection of technology and writing, including book history, dystopian literature, and digital humanities. Her collection, Composition and Big Data, co-edited with Ben Miller, was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in September 21. And she is also the author of the, ch of the chapter, The Past, Present, and Future of Social Annotation, in the collection in digital reading and writing in compo, uh, composition studies. Like I said, foremost expert on social annotation in the world. Um, Alan Reed is an associate professor of first year writing and instruction, instructional technologies at Coastal Carolina University. Also a title, I mean, the first part we've had first year writing for a while, but the combo of first year writing and instructional technologies probably also didn't exist a long time ago. I'm glad that it does. Um, he teaches courses in composition, new media, digital culture and design, and graduate writing and research. He has designed and taught a variety of graduate courses in the instructional design and technology doctoral programs at Johns Hopkins University, Old Dominion University, and North Central University. In addition, Reed is the uh, evaluation analyst at the Center for Research and Reform in Education, an adjunct teaching fellow in the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University. He's written two books, The Smartphone Paradox and The Philosophy of Gun Violence. Uh, what amazing contemporary uh, topics to have, to have published on uh, that examine the intersectionality of humanity and technological artifacts. He has also edited the book, Marginalia in Modern Learning Context. Again, one of the foremost experts in the world on uh, social annotation. And that, that collection is a, a, of, of innovative research on the methods and applications of interaction between readers and text through digital means such as commenting or physical annotation, such as writing the margins of books, and how these strategies can be applied in educational settings. How exciting is this? Um, all right, let me uh, just share. Uh, can, can one of the, oh, that's the wrong way. Can somebody, just because I'm not able to see you guys and um, and the uh, my presentation I'm trying to share at the same time, can, some, can one of the speakers just unmute and say that you can see this next slide? I see a red slide saying getting on the same page. Perfect. Okay, we're good. Uh, no more technical snags. I, I think I've mastered it now. It's a new platform for me, too. Uh, so let's get on the same page here. Um, so I, I'm trained as an English educator, as are, I think, my colleagues uh, in conversation today. Um, and well before I got interested in digital technologies uh, and, and, and to be applied in the classroom, um, I always told my students to annotate. I believed it was going to be critical for their success in my classes. And I would actually hand out this poem by Billy Collins, which I believe uh, Alan references in the, in the preface to his book, um, to try to inspire them on day one to write in the margins. We've all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages, we pressed a thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. Now, this was not a radical pedagogical innovation on my part. Annotation has been around for a very long time. Uh, scholars and students, since the, at least the invention of the book, have used annotation. Uh, it helps with memory, facilitates comprehension, and develops critical thinking skills. Um, as I uh, moved through graduate school in English, I did become interested in digital pedagogy um, and digital tools for the classroom. Um, and I really 
I still remember the day that I was in a computer lab at the University of Texas and I saw the social annotation tool Digo. And I guess basically I fell in love at that time. I just knew of all the things I'd been playing with in the classroom, digital tools, um, of all the things I'd been introduced to, this one just made so much sense to me. Again, probably because it was so familiar from this history. Um, and I got very excited and I got very obsessed. I kind of made it the one, well, the one tool that we used throughout uh, the semester in my freshman comp courses at UT Austin. Um, and the rest is history. I moved into the tech space to try to uh, develop this tool specifically for classroom application. And, and that's where Hypothesis is uh, today, uh, providing social annotation technology to colleges and universities across the world. Um, there was a 10 years ago, I guess, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education that I thought really captured the power of social annotation and social reading. And it's from Jennifer Howard. She writes, online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. Um, and that continues to be what excites me about social reading and social annotation. It is that connectivity as um, as Devorah Lieberman was talking about in the uh, keynote. Um, that's what really drew me to education. Uh, that's what drew me to teaching. That's what drew me to grad school. I wasn't interested, actually, it turned out to be in a sort of isolated research researcher in a library. I really enjoyed being in the classroom with other people. When I couldn't be in the classroom, I wanted still to connect to them. And that's why social annotation uh, really became such an important part of my pedagogy and now of my, uh, my profession uh, beyond teaching. So I'll just quickly share the sort of, for those that aren't familiar with social annotation uh, as it exists, you know, in tools like Hypothesis. Um, this is our model for Hypothesis that any website, article, ebook, document, piece of multimedia that might be, might be being used in the classroom as an artifact for students to engage with has multiple layers of annotation and really of, of conversation. There can be a private layer of marginalia, uh, uh, your notes, right, which is that kind of layer has always existed on top of, uh, you know, analog books. But there can be these other social layers of different communities reading uh, and thinking uh, and building knowledge together. Um, I can have a, a layer on a text that I'm teaching with my colleagues, or maybe it's a text in my field that we're all reading together, um, you know, as part of our a part of our research and scholarship. Um, I can have a layer uh, for my course, for each, each course that I teach, maybe the same text or different text, I can have group discussion on top of the text with a tool like Hypothesis. And finally, there is a public layer uh, for Hypothesis. And I think that's one of the things that really distinguishes it from, you know, an ed tech tool uh, that's really just disposable and used in a classroom and, and not beyond, is that this is a tool that exists online and everyday users are using it uh, to engage with content and with other people online. And there's a variety of professions that have started to make use of social annotation as a core technology to their, uh, to their profession. Um, so with that introduction, um, I am going to pass it to Amanda, and then we'll hear from Alan, and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that really humbling introduction and for having us here today. Um, can everyone, everyone want to give a thumbs up if you can see the slides and hear me okay? Wonderful. <clears throat> okay. So... I am coming to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the traditional lands of, of the Lenape tribe, where it is currently, I think, 94 degrees outside um, and later in the afternoon, about 1.30 in the afternoon here. Um, so go ahead, next slide for me, Jeremy. So in both my role as a faculty member, and I do teach for the English department and the digital humanities program, but also in my role as an instructional designer, I often hear a very common lament from faculty members that students aren't doing the reading. I think we can all relate to this, right? That how can I tell if my students are reading? How do I know if my students are doing a reading? How do I know if they're understanding the reading? And the traditional response to that kind of query is to give quizzes or other high stakes, high anxiety assignments. This quote that you see in front of you is one that just haunts me. It says here, right, that those who read with a pen in hand form a species nearly extinct, right? And that we no longer engage in that conversation that time and distance otherwise makes impossible. The reason why this haunts me is because of what I'm about to show you in contrast, which is on the next slide, Jeremy. This is a screen capture from my Kindle that shows that 9,940 people 
have annotated this text. And bonus points, extra credit for anyone who can name this text in the chat before I tell you what it is. So I can't imagine that all of these readers were required to use this particular Kindle edition for a class assignment, although perhaps a small percentage are students. And this is a rather popular book, but certainly capital L literature, right? The literature that we, the three of us here got degrees in, right? And yes, Thomas and Douglas, you both get the extra credit. This is George Orwell's 1984. And yes, I do mean for this to be ironic, right? These readers are, in Logan's words, right? Engaging in a conversation, time and distance otherwise would make impossible. So I wanna shift the conversation from assuming that students do not annotate or do not read, right? And instead explore how and why we want students to annotate. Why should they do the reading? Why should they be annotating? What does that look like for us as educators? Next slide, please. So this quote is uh, from Jason Jones um, in their Our New, their Our New Note directions and annotations. And I love that title because everything new is old, right? Well, all of our new media stems from old media. And here, um, Jones is saying, the notion of better understanding a, a text through others' experience of it is arguably the foundational experience of most liberal arts classrooms. And this is what I mean about the why or the should students annotate. And I think for me, it's that perhaps many an academics or educators privilege certain kinds of annotations over others. We imagine that solitary scholar in the archives making annotations to themselves and for their own learning. But what we really want, right, what we really think is worthy of attention is those conversations, those debates, that the exchange of information between people in the classroom, that's what we're trying to encourage and facilitate is not the, the, the person learning for their own sake, but for that collective community building the knowledge building that happens in the classroom as we talk to each other. And yes, that could be asynchronously or synchronously as we've all discovered over the last two years. So what I wanna say here is that I really, um, I really agree with Jones that it's the conversational function. It's the act of discovery and sharing that we align with our practice in the humanities. And in this view, marginalia is not a personal act, but a public act that can and should be archived and shared in order to teach our students how to engage in conversational marginalia and to provide them models. So next slide here. Um, of course, there are historical roots to my argument. And I'm gonna start with what uh, Jeremy prefaced for me is the Book Traces um, project. So here we can see um, examples of marginalia. The, the example on your screen is of Walt, of Walt Whitman, but this goes way back such as the Talmud, which we just heard about in the keynote, um, early modern book of hours, and the many famous authors whose annotations we fetishize, right? We think about how authors have annotated other famous authors' books, right? We study these in the archives, we see them published um, in articles about um, these scholars and authors. We also see this kind of intention to uh, archive and document marginalia and these conversations that were happening in the margins by thinkers like Van Iver Bush and Douglas Engelbart, who predicted the need for a network of associated texts. These examples have all been explored in great depth elsewhere, but I wanna talk about how I introduced this to students and how I use these as models for their own annotation. So over the past decade, I have been actively a member of the Book Traces Project, and I use this as a way of, to substantiate and demonstrate the long tail of social annotation practices. When I was teaching at NYU and now at the University of Pennsylvania, I actually invite my students to go into the stacks. And we're talking about the circulating stacks, not rare books or special collections. And what we do is we go to the stacks, we identify a set of texts that they're gonna look in and they actually take the books off the shelf, get their hands dirty and look for marginalia in these books that are sitting on library shelves. Well, as you can imagine with a place like um, Butler Library or Van Pelt Library, we find a lot of original 19th century annotation. Why? In the 19th century, you see a rise in multiple copies of books being published, papers cheaper, um, there's more circulation of multiple copies of texts, but also because that is when a lot of our academic libraries started getting donations, large donations from 
private families, from um, local institutions that were donating in bulk their entire collections. So not only do you have that capital L literature, but you have a whole wide variety of things that were donated as part of those collections. So when you go into the stacks, you might find items that maybe have never been checked out before, <laughs> right? Or a copy of a text that's never been checked out before. And you can find not only marginalia from these 19th century readers, but also locks of hair, flowers, scraps of fabric. Um, we often find those early um, library cards that have <laughs> the, the holes cut out of them, right? That carry the, the card catalog information, lots of interesting items. What this really says to me is that 19th century readers were not only annotating, they were annotating multimodally, right? By putting in these drawings, these locks of hair, these scraps of fabric, these flowers, but also if we read and analyze the annotations, which we have done as part of the Book Traces project, we find out that their annotations are not for themselves, but actually are in conversations with others. Many times that's family members. We found whole family genealogies, mothers talking to daughters, talking to grandmothers, and so on throughout the generations. But we also find annotations that are talking to other communities, religious communities, groups of women who are sharing one copy of a book, right, to try to teach each other and share that knowledge. But also we have found illicit romances between members of the royal family. We have found battle schematics by famous generals, right? We have found all sorts of fantastic annotations that show that these margins were a way of communicating information across time and space. So by having my students get their hands dirty, actually get book dust right on their hands and find these annotations, they are really able to see that this is not a new phenomenon. This is not something that just happens on their Kindle, but this has been happening across time. So uh, next slide, please. So this is actually a picture from our uh, Book Traces event that just happened in April at the University of Pennsylvania. We pulled 250 books off the shelf and our hit rate, meaning there was a high level of annotations, was over 60%. In fact, there was one group that found an annotations in every single book they looked at. Their hit rate was 100%. Um, we found so many amazing discoveries here. And what I wanted to really convey to you is that this project not only allows students to see the annotations, but it also allows them to understand acquisition history. It familiarizes students with the legacy of print collections. It provides a sense of history and provenance for the offerings available to them. And suddenly the role of the library expands from a convenient place to study to a resource that serves the greater purpose of maintaining collections of invaluable research materials. Searching for these annotations also leads to discussions about what counts as meaningful evidence in the marginalia they find, and students discover many interesting artifacts that we, the Book Traces team, and their librarians and professors are there to help them assess, decipher, and digitize for use by you or anyone else around the world to, to data mine and study the findings across the dozens of universities we've done Big Book Traces events at. So then the discussion moves from what are these marginalia, what are we looking at here, and the move to digitizing text and to opening the conversation to the future of the humanities at large, right? How can we make old forms of media accessible to a wider audience? Next slide, please. As the pedagogical director of Book Traces, I help others integrate this work into their courses. During the pandemic, it became obvious that people needed a way to interact with this material, not in their own libraries, because they couldn't search the stacks. Right? They didn't have access to their libraries during a large part of this time. So what we did was we made this open access resource full of assignments, prompts, and grab-and-go materials for use by librarians, instructors, or workshop leaders in any discipline. And you can go to this URL. I put the link um, to these slides in the chat. Um, and you can explore all of these assignments and contact me anytime for help using them with your students. Next slide, please. So at Stevenson University, which is my previous position, we didn't actually have a research library at all. We did not have a library that would hold volumes of pre-1923 texts. So what we did instead was we used this site and Andrew Stoffer came and gave a talk as a part of our distinguished speaking series and brought several ex examples with him. And even with this very li limited engagement with just the website alone, you can see that the materials had a huge impact on my students. 
you can see here, this is a quote from one of my students, um, and he, it's really an expert reflection. He was able to recognize and articulate the social function of the annotations he found. Um, and he likens this in, in this um, passage, right, to email or social media. He, the marginalia in 19th century text reminded him of social media, right, because of that exchange between people. So my goal is to capture this knowledge and translate it into a student's own reading practices. So next slide, please. To start this process, students read about the differences between reading online versus reading in print from a variety of perspectives. I have students read born digital articles, but also actual physical paper articles where I have them read for a given amount of time and make tally marks anytime they're distracted. So yes, they end up with 15, 20, sometimes even 30 tally marks when they got distracted in their reading practices. I then have them read the same exact article, but while annotating, right? And they distract, they have far fewer tally marks, right? During that time when they were actively annotating than when they were just trying to read straight through. I often ask them if they were given a short quiz on the content after the initial reading versus out of after the, the reading when they were annotating, which they feel they would perform better on. The answer is obvious, right? When they're an annotated, annotating, they retained more of that information. So, Kathy Davidson, whose article you see here, or whose book, sorry, you see here, argues that the ability to productively multitask is a vital 21st century skill. Students are asked to identify their own attention blindness and then given tools that work with and not against their natural inclination to bounce from one task to another, right? So instead of saying, stop getting distracted, stop multitasking, think about productive ways of multitasking, which I really think social annotation offers us a chance to do. Uh, next slide. So I have tried many different online annotation platforms. I have tried Annotation Studio and Google Docs and Perusal and you name it, I have tried it. The reason why I personally like Hypothesis is because it can both be used with an LMS, so Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, um, or as a standalone product with your web browser. And most importantly for me, you can use multimodal annotations. So you can see here in my very meta activity of having people annotate about, <laughs> right, reading online. <laughs> um, they are using videos and links and they're having conversations back and forth. And this, this is a real screen grab from a real class and a real student assignments with real student writing, right? So you can see them having robust conversations and using all of the tools that Hypothesis offers to share information. It's peer-to-peer -peer learning in action, okay? Um, next slide. You can see from this exchange here that my students recognize the potential benefits, but also the drawbacks of social annotation skills, oh, sorry, tools. Armed with the readings I provide and previous discussions we had about digital reading, class debates are often rich, both online, as you see here, and off. Ruminations formulated in their annotations are hashed out in greater depth in person, be it synchronous or asynchronous, right? Be it online or in person um, in the classroom. And this allows for conversations that are too big for the constraints of a comment section to take place to evolve. I'm often able to identify the areas where my students are struggling to understand a text by reading their comments, or in some cases by identifying sections in which no one has commented. This is very important, okay? These omissions can signal a place where no one was brave enough to take on the difficult language or advanced concepts. This way students engage with a text online in ways that form the way I structure my synchronous lessons. I am better able to use our limited class time strategically when provided with access to their asynchronous comments. Next slide, please. So this is how I sequence this assignment. So first I have students annotate the text online. I try to leave space for students to respond to each other before I interject. I obviously interject when needed, when there's a debate arise or a question that has uh, arisen that I can answer, but I try to let them have space to just talk to each other first. I then use student insi insights as slides in class. So I screenshot in interesting insights or I screenshot interesting conversations and I put them in my slides and I use it as the catalyst for the lesson of the day. What does that look like? Well, often I'll take a debate or a, a, a question of how a term is defined or used in a text 
And then I provide in the following slides further research for those debates. So sometimes it's definitions from our professional standards, our professional sources. It's links to articles that have further information. It's, I also provide quotes or from course readings we've done previously and try to model that good information sharing behavior that then I see them mimic in future annotations. So from those individual low stakes annotations assignments, I then derive writing prompts. So this could be discussion board posts, right? Journal entries, whatever works best for your class. Um, and I will often do those in groups. So five people are gonna do discussion board posts for this article, five for the next, five for the next. Cuts down on your grading time, right? You're only grading five posts at a time. And also on the student's workload, they're only in charge of leading the conversation for one text at a time. Um, that then becomes um, the, you know, a student-led discussion. So those five people will lead a fishbowl, right? And those eventually lead to students gleaning information from those conversations and links for their high stakes multimodal essay. Um, next slide, please. So this is what that looks like. Um, I have my students apply what they learned when creating their final multimodal projects inspired by an assignment shared by Carrie Krause. So in this assignment, they're engaging in design fiction by imagining the future of the book. So I, I actually collaborate with a uh, faculty member in the School of Design for this, where students identify a problem in the way we currently consume assess, access, and store information, and devise solutions for a specific audience. So here you, you're seeing this student create a smart bookmark where you can read a physical book, but put in this smart bookmark that will allow you to um, put annotations and definitions into a digital notebook while you read. Very smart, right? Um, next slide. And this student here was thinking about their aunt who has ALS and couldn't actually physically hold a book or turn pages of a physical book. So they were using eye tracking software so that their aunt could use annotations with eye tracking technology. Very, very smart. And again, addressing a problem for a specific audience. Um, so I know I'm about out of time here, but these are only two examples from dozens that I don't have time to showcase. I believe the evidence is clear. What you don't see here in these screenshots is their extensive research incorporated in many forms in these proposals. And you don't hear their passion and excitement that students convey in their oral presentations. But hopefully what you can see is that students went from the passive consumers of annotation technologies to active critical makers, thinking about the future of annotation and what that might look like for their audiences. Next slide. Um, so you can actually see my entire guide to using Hypothesis on my website. There's the link, there's videos for how to use it with the LMS or as a standalone with my assignment all laid out for you. And next slide. You can also read the full article in Digital Reading and Writing and Composition Studies. Thank you so much. That was so great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, excellent. Well, we'll turn it over to Alan. And then, as I said, after we hear from Alan, we'll have a, a q and A. I I know there's questions coming in. And we'll have a discussion. All yours, Alan. Thanks. Yeah, that was really comprehensive, thorough, Amanda. You are definitely one of the foremost experts. I will agree with Jeremy on that. Um, I don't have any slides to share because I was going to just kind of um, reminisce about social annotation and, and what um, kind of landed me here. I was thinking, like, how did, how did I get interested in social annotation? Why, um, why am I here? And, and why did I write so much about it? Um, and I think it stems from right out of graduate school, I was kind of thrown into the classroom, right? I was thrown into a, a classroom of undergraduates, first year writing, your standard English 101 type courses. Um, with, with very little guidance or anything like, like that. And this is the early um, 2000s when there was a real shift towards the digital texts. Um, and I can remember being, being worried about that. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an English guy, I'm an English professor. And so I'm, um, you know, I love books. I love holding books. I love writing in books. Um, but I saw this uh, real shift in students opting for the digital. Um, and I think a lot, Price probably had a lot to do with that. Convenience had a lot to do with that. Um, but I was also noticing that in, in the polling and in surveys, we were seeing that um, students time and time again would reiterate that they actually prefer 
print materials. Um, yet they will often choose digital materials for those reasons, price, affordability, convenience, um, and things like that. And the thing that worried me about that is um, that I also had a hunch that we read differently when we're reading something in print versus something digitally. Um, and in fact, there's a, um, uh, let me type it in the chat here. There's a great book by Naomi Barron uh, from American University called Words on Screen, if you've not seen that before, but she outlines this whole argument in its entirety, and it's really fascinating. Um, but it was really uh, worrisome for me as well because I saw this happening in my students. Um, and so what I began to do was I, I began to shift all of my materials um, into things like Google Docs um, and have them comment in these documents as we would go. And what I didn't realize was that I was having them annotate things socially um, within their assignments. And I wasn't grading it. I wasn't requiring it. I was merely providing it as an option. And, and most of these students were taking me up on this. Um, and so I decided to conduct an actual experimental study on this. It was a small case study, but we looked at um, the differences between readers who were annotating synchronously. So at the same time that someone uh, in the same class was reading the same document, you could see the comments popping up synchronously in real time. Another group was looking at existing annotations while they were reading the text. So the annotations were already there, much like picking up an old book from the library, something that has writing in the margins already. And then the third group was a control group. Um, no annotations, no ability to annotate. And what we saw was a significant difference between these three groups in terms of important things, not just achievement, um, such as comprehension on a post-test, but in terms of things like learner motivation, um, mental effort required to read and understand the text, um, preference, satisfaction, um, which I think are all very important contributors to um, a student's performance in a class and not just the score on the uh, final uh, post-test. And so that really got me thinking about how I could start to use social annotation more formally and more effectively in my courses. And I think it was around that time that I, I kind of um, began collaborating with Jeremy and Hypothesis and um, realizing like, oh, there's a whole world out here of people who have these same views and here's this technology, here's this tool that I can use um, in my classes seamlessly. Um, and I remember being so excited about that um, because I, wa I wasn't really happy with all the other social bookmarking sites and um, things like that. And Google Docs wasn't quite cutting it. So once I came across um, Hypothesis, I was really thrilled. Um, and so I started implementing that formally in my courses. Um, I started doing that um gosh i don't know almost 10 years ago I, I guess maybe um and then i started thinking about things beyond just sort of informally annotating works as we go and started thinking about things like prompting um, and metacognitive strategies and things like that that i could actually embed into the documents and into the pages on on the websites and different things um, that could actually prompt my learners to think about specific things as they were reading. So I was sort of flipping the script and saying, okay, well, we can use annotation for you to generate your own annotations on these materials, but I can also use annotation to set you up to think about certain things or to prompt you in certain ways within the texts, as opposed to using like supplemental questions or um, discussion boards or something like that. Um, and so that, I think, really started to get me thinking, and that's um, a large part of what my doctoral work, um, dissertation work involved, was embedded um, metacognitive and cognitive strategy prompting within digital texts. So not just asking learners like adjunct questions within the text about what they were reading, but asking them, um, giving them metacognitive prompts to either maybe draw their attention back to the text, um, or to um, ask them to rate their level of understanding as we go, um, all sorts of different things that Hypothesis afforded me to do within these texts. I will say that um, there's probably, a, there's, there's a balance, right? Because what we did see with that is there's probably a saturation point where you can um, 
have too many annotations within a text and it starts to override the learner's cognitive load um, and anxiety levels and things like that where it starts to um, it starts to supersede what uh, the actual content is, is conveying. So I will say that there is a, there's probably a ceiling on this. Um, but what we saw were extremely um, positive results in terms of, again, not just achievement, but motivation and satisfaction, um, a reduction of mental effort while they were reading. And we saw these changes particularly within groups of lower level readers. So in other words, um, the high achieving readers um, would contribute and would use annotations really well. Um, but their gains were not nearly as significant as lower level readers. Um, and so that learner population became the focus. And we started to realize like, okay, this is a tool that we can start to target this specific population and we can tailor these specific um, prompts and comments and things towards this population to help them. And that's exactly what it did. Um, and so we then took that model and we applied it to this program. I'm going to try and share my screen. I didn't try this beforehand. Sorry. Um, well, I'm going to have to. Oh, this might work. Okay. Um, we had a um, digital badging initiative at, at uh, Coastal Carolina University in 2014 where we essentially said for the first year writing courses, that's English 101 and English 102, um, the standard freshman year writing courses, English courses, um, we developed a set of badges, um, about six or seven badges per course that identified specific skills. So in other words, we, we basically took the learning outcomes from each of those courses and said, what do we want students to be able to do at the end of English 101? Okay, well, they need to be able to shape a thesis, summarize, um, quote, paraphrase, synthesize, all sorts of different things. And we, we parsed these out into specific badges where the website, which is sort of, it's still available, it's still out here, you can access it. I'll post the link in the chat. Um, we keep it just as a writing resource for the public, but we've since moved, moved it internally. Um, students would, access each of the badge pages where they receive some type of instructional content. So sometimes it could be um, a produced video that we had um, developed from faculty. We give a text-based explanation of what we're talking about. This particular badge had to do with shifting styles and linguistic awareness. Um, but one of the first things that we decided to do was to include or embed hypothesis into this uh, website, which is actually just hosted on a WordPress platform. Um, and what that did effectively was we were able to say to students, not just, hey, go to this website and read this um, content, watch the video, read this content, and then do the assignment at the end. But as you're reading it, we want you to also annotate and ask questions um, or piggyback on other people's comments. And that's exactly what they did. Most people didn't require this as part of the assignment. But what we found was that students were doing this voluntarily because um, they could see other students had, who had been there previously, the types of questions they were asking or the types of links, connections they were drawing to this and to other works. Um, and so we thought this was a really effective thing for all of the incoming students into this first year writing program to be able to use. And it was actually a really big success. Um, and so the reason I point that out is because um, when we were developing the program, which is essentially just a, a bunch of web pages um, where we're asking students to read the instructional content and then develop the assignment and then submit the assignment, we were trying to liven it up by saying, how can we make this a much more dynamic, active activity rather than just a passive reading of a page, which I'm um, sort of terrified of students doing. And Hypothesis was the first thing that, that came to our mind. Um, I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay. Um, and so that's where we are. And that's that's been my um, experience with social annotation. It's something that is just now ingrained 
in all the things that we do. I teach still um, some undergraduate courses, but also uh, doctoral courses um, in, in all sorts of areas for a number of institutions. And one of the very first things that we do as an assignment is the syllabus annotation assignment, which simply asks the students in that course to read closely the syllabus and to annotate it, to um, make comments, to ask questions, to draw attention to different things in the syllabus. And it's a way to immediately engage learners into the course, but also to ensure that uh, they're actually reading the syllabus and that um, they don't actually have any questions. But I think it's a great introductory assignment for any level of uh, course. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I think that's that's all I really wanted to talk about. Um, I think we should open it up to Q&A and see what kinds of questions you have. Okay, I'm not sure how and when we're allowed to be seen and heard, uh, but I'm, I'm back as is Amanda. Uh, that was so wonderful. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Amanda. We do have some uh, great questions um, to get to. Um, and so let's get to them. Um, there's a, a one question in the chat uh, from Karen at Vincennes University. Uh, how can you get students to open the book to do the reading in the first place? So this is, you know, that problem that Amanda sort of hinted at. I don't know if you were agreeing with the, the problem as it's normally stated, Amanda, that the students aren't doing the reading, but uh, could each of you guys just talk about ways that you sort of help encourage students to actually do the reading, then we'll, we'll get into the annotation piece, and maybe the annotation piece helps. Let's start with you, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I answered a little bit in the chat, and also I see that Karen has um, put this also in the Q&A. Um, so in, in that, in the Q&A, Karen writes that um, they use reflection questions that, an, that require students to read and find answers, but they find that the students just Google them without actually reading the text. So there is actually an amazing data-driven article on this. I believe it's by Admiral and Pohl, and it actually compares discussion board post engagement versus social annotation tool engagement. And what it finds is that <clears throat> when you require students to annotate a text, you have more line by line interaction. So students are, are interacting with individual lines in the text um, in an in-depth way, which I would call close reading, right? Instead of skimming or surface level reading, they're really going at a line by line level to think about what the author is saying specifically. Whereas discussion board posts, you get more of that broad summary, right? Where students are just lightly engaging with the text in a, in a superficial or shallow way. Um, they might quote one line if you require them to, right? But it's more of, of that broad statement. And at least for me, as someone who teaches composition courses, I am always trying to say, don't generalize, don't make broad claims, don't make those kinds of statements. Instead, really go to the text and do the close reading. And that's what I believe social annotation, um, you know, enhances their ability to do that. So I did post in the, in the chat my kind of strategy, but what I like to do is I start with a very short reading at the very beginning. Um, E.M. Forrester's The Machine Stops is a great short story to do this with. Um, I've also used readings about reading online, which I showed in my presentation, but a very short reading. And I have them do just five annotations and three replies just to learn the tool and just to understand what I mean by um, I can see you right reading by using this tool because I can really see the engagement of each individual student. Um, and I give them very clear prompts about what kinds of annotations they can engage with. So I offer definitions, um, links to further resources or research. For example, if they don't know what a certain phrase or concept is, right, they can link to the definition of that. Um, I also offer, uh, you know, offering counter arguments or points of um, um disagreeing with the author, points of agreeing with the author, and also um, points where they disagree and agree with each other, right? Again, 
requiring them to reply to each other. That way, not only are they engaging with the text in their own original way, but they also have to engage with their <laughs> peers' comments on the text, which makes you think on an even deeper level about what the text is saying and doing in, in a, through someone else's perspective. Um, yes, this can go directly to your grade book. I often just grade this with a check mark though, right? Like they're just getting a yay or nay. They just did it or didn't do it. Um, and I linked in my um, blog post on it, how I use a probe rubric, which is about how the, edu the posts need to be educational. They need to be educating their fellow students to count. So they can't just be like, this was good. I like this, cool, right? <laughs> but they actually have to be offering information that the other students learn from. Um, and then you can just, you know, make the stakes higher as you go along with longer articles, increase it to, to 10 or 20 annotations and 10 replies, so on and so forth. Alan, any thoughts on how to get the students to, to do the reading, uh, either using annotation or other means? Oh, man, you know, I, that's, I don't know if that's a question about annotation or, I mean, if we, if we knew the answer to that, like how to motivate students to do anything that we want them to do, I think would be rich but um you know annotation can make it at, at the very least active right so you will have students who just will flat out tell you that they hate reading i hate reading i don't like to read um well this isn't just reading this is contributing this is responding this is interacting with the text um and i think one of the questions on here was about um sometimes it being hard to get students onboarded and to see it how it can be fun. I, one of the things that I used to do, I haven't done this so much recently, um, was we would have an all media annotation session, which some documents we would say, okay, I want you to annotate this and respond to these different texts uh, or different sections in this text, but I want you to do it solely through media, whether that's uh, memes, GIFs or GIFs, however you want to say it, um, or photos, right? Or uh, there's been times we we try to use emojis too and try to express it that way. But um, so making it a little bit more challenging for them and saying like, what kind of meme would best express how you're feeling right now? Um, that's a pretty easy way to get them thinking about how to use it. And then once they're familiar with how to use hypothesis, which is pretty easy to use, um, then I think they're more likely to go along with you on other assignments. I love that uh, idea, Alan, that it's, maybe the idea of what reading is, uh, is maybe one reason why students don't do the reading because they're like uh, expected or maybe they think that they're expected to be passive uh, absorbers of the information. But if you make it active, you say, this is a place for you to create, uh, for you to respond, for you to engage with others, you make it social, it's something different. Uh, it's a different experience. Um, and I think we could get into this in the next question. Uh, I should say there are some, they're not that many international experts uh, on social annotation in the classroom. Two are on the panel here for sure. There are some in the audience as well. Um, and one of the questions is from another um, early adopter of Hypothesis, a longtime friend and collaborator of mine, uh, Robin DeRosa at Plymouth State University. And you, you hinted at this question, um, Alan, but I wanna go deeper into it. And, and Amanda responded in, in the Q&A area, but let's, let's talk about it. Um, Robin says, my students love hypothesis, but sometimes it's hard to get uh, on get uh, get on board uh, to get get them onboarded, I suppose, and help them see how fun it can be. How do you introduce it to students and help them enjoy the process? So let's talk about introducing students to a social annotation. How you kind of frame uh, the assignment and the activity, um, but also the pleasure that can come uh, from social annotation. And maybe we'll start with you this time, Alan. And go to Amanda. I was just thinking, and, and I, this always makes me sound like old man talking here, but like with, we're, we're living in a social media generation. And the reality that is that most of these students are used to being producers and not just consumers of information, but that's exactly what they do. They don't just consume social media or what they're seeing online. They're actually producing. They're actually contributing to that. And so it doesn't quite make sense for us to then step into the classroom and say, okay, now you're only going to consume the stuff that I'm giving you. Well, they want to produce. That's what they're used to doing. Um, and hypothesis gives them a way to do that. Um, and I think that's really important is to kind of draw that parallel between th this is a very, um, I mean, coming from a, a new media background, like this is a very new media um, approach to a very traditional practice of 
reading and comprehending. This is the new media approach to that is um, to be generative as you do that old practice. It's like TikTok for your books. Or something. There you go. <laughs> uh, Amanda, your thoughts? Uh, thanks so much, Robin, for this question. I did answer you in the Q&A comments um, with two links. I start with genius.com. So if you ask anyone in the class, you know, how many people have used genius.com before, you're going to get a couple of hands. Um, you're, you know, musically inclined folks. Um, in my like composition classes and general um, courses, I might start with Beyonce's Lemonade and I show the debate about who Becky with the good hair is, right? And I show them that people all around the world are annotating lyrics on genius.com. Um, and we talk about why people are annotating them and why people care what a music lyric might mean. Um, in my immigrant literature class, I always start with um, the song Immigrants from the Hamilton mixtape um, because the author themselves has actually annotated that on genius.com along with his audience. So you see interaction between the author and the audience in that. And we talk about that form of annotation and that kind of um, knowledge sharing. Um, and then we talk about the ways that they live tweet events or write live stream on TikTok or um, Instagram, how they use Goodreads, right, to share information about books all the time. One of my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Jim English, has a huge large scale data mining um, project going on with Goodreads that show that there are Goodread users that read thousands of books a year, thousands of books a year, right, and share their thoughts on those books on Goodread. So we already know that students are doing this, right? They, they are doing this on all sorts of other platforms that we may or may not integrate into our class. Um, the, the, it's pretty easy once you show that they're already doing it to just transfer that knowledge, to transfer that skill set into the classroom using this tool that's ready made for, for academic work. But then also the beauty of the hypothesis is that they can keep using this outside of your classroom. It is an open source tool that they can use for anything. Um, I'm in a reading group right now, and we are using Hypothesis to annotate the book Design Justice. And there's just people from all over the world annotating Design Justice for fun, <laughs> right? For our own engagement. Um, it's not part of any class, we're not getting any grade, right? Um, and there's lots of other examples of that. Um, you do, I think, though, need to talk about, like, again, the drawback backs of some of that engagement, right? How to be a good digital citizen, um, how people are, 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 how authors are vulnerable online and how information that we post in online spaces still has humans behind them. And to be, you know, thoughtful, generous, compassionate to those authors that have put their thoughts online, but also to be compassionate to each other in the comments, right? And think about kind of the harassment, trolling, and vitriol that happens in comment spaces um, online and how um, what is appropriate and inappropriate to put in those comment sections. So I think really this this extends beyond like how do I get students to annotate and how do I get students to be good digital citizens who are already annotating, right, in all sorts of other spaces at, that we're, we're very well aware that they're doing. That's great. I love uh, your point. Um, and I this is why I was attracted to genius.com. Can you guys hear me? I'm getting a, a funny sound. OK. Um, uh, why I was attracted to genius uh, as, a, as a platform as well, that you're already doing this work, this work that I'm trying to kind of, you know, train you in or introduce you to or develop your skills in. It's something that you're already doing. Right. You leave a movie. You have a conversation probably with the person that you went to the movie with, right? You're excited about a song. You talk about some piece of it that really gets you. So these are activities that, you know, everyday you know, folks are engaged with that sort of are also part of the formal um, work of the humanities. Um, but let me ask a question of my uh, humanities colleagues here in terms of broadening uh, the scope here um, to make sure that we're including, you know, all the different uh, disciplines in the, in the academy. Is this just a English uh, literature, you know, adjacent um, uh, disciplines thing, a humanities thing, as it were? Or let's talk about social annotation as, some, as something broader in the academy in terms of the skills that, that students need in college and maybe specific disciplinary skills they need in, in other disciplines. And I, your nod was more vociferous, Amanda, so we'll start with you and then go to Alan. Um, so when, as our wonderful keynote speaker talked about when, you know, March 13th, 
a 2020 hit and we all moved online. Um, my previous institution, Stevenson University, actually made everyone do like emergency Blackboard training that included together as an entire faculty socially annotating an article together using hypothesis on Blackboard. Like every single Got faculty it. member and the whole university was required to annotate a text together. I didn't um, know that. That's amazing. Yes. It, um, you, you might remember that uh, before the pandemic, they were hemming and hawing about integrating it, but then the pandemic hit and I won the fight. Um, <laughs> I do remember that. And we've got tremendous adoption at Stevenson and we just yes. found out one reason why. <laughs> and now every single faculty member across the disciplines uses the LMS plugin for Hypothesis in their classes. I'm talking nursing, biology, um, fine arts. Um, you know, we have a huge uptake in the, in the business school, right? But seriously, across all disciplines. First of all, all disciplines have texts, right? You're teaching articles in higher education. You're teaching PDFs of someone talking about your subject, right? Every, every single discipline does have a text. So there's something to annotate. But you also, I think that increasingly, especially in, in teaching focused institutions and teaching focused classrooms, you do wanna create a atmosphere where students are learning from each other, that you're not just the sage on stage who's like providing all the information, but that your students feel like empowered to also be experts in, in areas where they can offer insight. So it, if you present that as an option, if you empower them to learn from each other, um, I think using social annotation is a really good precursor to other forms of group work, right? If they're already used to discussing things in the margins with each other without your interjection, then when they get into that group work, which we know students have mixed feelings about, I'll be nice, <laughs> um, they, they, they will already be so familiar with working with each other and to uh, working out arguments and debates with each other in those spaces that when you actually get them into those peer learning groups, they will be more successful. Um, there are tons of great articles like the one I put into the chat of people in the sciences uh, using social annotation, but I just wanted to offer two alternate ways that I've used it. So I've actually used social annotation tools to have students peer review each other's work. So if you have an essay assignment coming up and you want um, a student to read their essay draft and comment on it, you can use social annotation for that. And you can have their peers comment on their own writing using social annotation. It's really a wonderful way to get that peer-to-peer -peer feedback. Um, and also I've had students use social annotation to do rhetorical analysis. So read this article and determine the purpose, the audience, the context, the genre, um, and do that kind of formal analysis work, which is a form of annotation that they're doing for themselves. But of course they also share um, that knowledge out. So those are just two alternate um, assignment forms. Alan? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to get really, um tunnel vision when talking about annotation because we are in that English umbrella. Um, but I, I'll say, I'll speak from experience, just um, writing this this last book that I was writing um, this past year, I had to dive into um, some constitutionality arguments and I'm not, a, I'm not a legal scholar by any means. So I really had to try and figure out um, a lot of the different um, arguments that are made, particularly on um, issues of Second Amendment rights and prima facie rights and all these things that were new to me. But I was really happy to see that when I went online to read more about this, there are numerous tools online that actually offer um, annotated versions of the Constitution. I, I think one is actually called Constitution Annotated, maybe. Um, there's another one. I was trying to look it up um, just now. I think it's called uh, Interactive Constitution which um, again is just an annotated version of the constitution and it shows you original drafts and changes that were made to it along with um, citing like court cases and precedents and things like that to um, help explain the legal terminology and jargon that's contained in the original document. So um, that's just one example, but I mean, there are thousands of examples in every field, every discipline, where annotation occurs and happens. Um, and sometimes it's it, it might not be called that, um, but that's what we're doing anytime we contribute or have a conversation within a text. That's awesome. Thank you both for those answers. Um, so let's tackle a tough topic. Um, there was a uh, skeptic, I believe, in the audience around multitasking. 
Uh, Amanda uh, suggested reading Kathy Davidson's book, uh, Now You See It, Now You Don't, which I also recommend. Kathy Davidson, also an OG member of the uh, Rap Genius community and, uh, and a hypothesis annotator as well. Um, uh, so let's talk about this question of multitasking. Um, and I'll just bring Alan into it a little bit because Alan, you talked about the ceiling of sometimes there might be too many annotations on a text um, that might there might might sort of become less useful. Um, and I will, at risk of being recorded and BP of Education at Hypothesis say, I still sometimes wonder, especially going back to the question of like making the students read, um, could annotations potentially sort of create a way for students to not read, to skip over um, the, the text and just read the annotations? Is that a problem? Um, so multitasking, multitasking, reading versus skimming, the noise of too many annotations, go uh uh alan <laughs> uh i mean i fall i fall into that camp of of thinking um that multitasking really is not um i, I won't say it's not possible because it's clearly possible um is it a good idea no probably not um we know that that a trade-off occurs when we multitask particularly um cognitively um nicholas carr wrote a great book about this called The Shallows that he um, really dives into all of these different issues and explains um, not just the neuroscience behind it, but um, the, the different um, trade-offs and benefits that we, um, that we have when we read digitally and when we try to do multiple things at once, particularly even like media multitasking. Um, I'm always on my kids about if they're on some kind of device in front of the television. I'm like, no, this, you can't, we can't be doing this. Um, you can choose one, you know, um, but there's, there's a rationale behind that. And that rationale is that, um, you know, it does fragment our attention. And I think there is a danger in over annotating something or perhaps, um, seeing too many annotations when you're trying to just get the original text. I, I think there probably is a balance, a healthy balance there. Um, I don't know what it is. I think it depends on whatever the text is, the type of text the type of reader, um, what's being said in the annotations and what's considered distracting versus useful. Um, I try to encourage students to always make substantive annotations. So like Amanda was mentioning earlier, like don't just write great or yes or me too. Um, it has to be substantive. You have to be contributing to the conversation. Otherwise, I don't know how valuable it is. Let me let me ask a, a question in the middle of the discussion here, um, and that is, is social annotation, is the use of hypothesis, is it multitasking or is it a way to reduce tasks <laughs> and, be, and and bring focus um, and closeness to one's reading practice? Um, so I, I don't know where the question is at this point, Amanda, but I know you're probably in the Davidson versus the car camp. Um, so we'll just let you take what you want from that. Yes, and I've, I make students read the Carr essay, <laughs> and they read an uh, essay by Lafarge, and um, they also read a, you know, some of Kathy Davidson's book, um, and they annotate all of them, right? And then we have an in-class debate about this. So I have thought about this across, I mean, a decade of teaching and hearing students' responses. And first, I'm, um, this is not directed at you, Ellen, or at the, the questioner, but um, I do want to point out that we're being extremely ableist in this conversation. So something like 40% of college students identify as um, not neurotypical, right? And Kathy Davidson points out in her book that the very first, the very first chapter is about the gorilla experiment, right? So you have um, a set of students passing a basketball back and forth, and you're supposed to count how many times the students with the white shirts catch the basketball. In the middle of this experiment, a person in a gorilla costume walks through the students tossing the basketball. And then you ask how many students saw the gorilla, right? And very few of them raise their hands. Most of them don't see the gorilla. Why? Because they're focused on the basketball, so they miss the gorilla. And in Kathy Davidson's book, she said that because she identifies as having ADHD and dyslexia, she can actually, she, she saw the gorilla because she wasn't hyper-focused on the basketball. She was looking at the whole picture. So this is what, Kathy calls attention blindness. And this is the idea that when we're hyper-focused on one thing, we miss the big picture. I don't know about you, but if I've given students a reading task, like find the number of times that, the, that they referenced the color red, right, in this novel, they miss the big picture. 
all they all they're looking for is the color red and they have missed the whole point of the novel right so so what i'm saying is that sometimes that hyper focused that we kind of have drilled students into believing is the point of education um, it, it, make, it gives them tunnel vision and they're unable to see kind of the, the larger point. And what is the point of having us close read a text? Is it so that they memorize how many rivers are in, um, <laughs> you know, the chapter five? Or is it, again, for that discussion so that they're talking about the social issues that they can give, give them a reflection or a lens to understand our world and their world and their cultures better? Um, for me, I, I don't really, you know, I don't care if they spell the, the minor character in chapter seven's name right. <laughs> I care that they're better understanding their peers, their world, and our social issues, right? So, um, yeah. So is multitasking a problem? Um, you know, I guess if you're trying to play a video game while you're while you're reading Ulysses, probably not going to work so well, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you're listening to music while you're doing your statistics homework, for a lot of people, that's incredibly successful multitasking, right? That's actually the only way that they can do the work. Um, I do want to say that I often offer students several ways in to the annotation process. So you can turn off annotations. There's a lovely little eye icon at the top of Hypothesis. You turn the eye shut, all the annotations go away and you can read that clean text before you open the annotations and start reading your peers' comments or offering your own. So yes, you can read the text unadulterated. I also obviously provide print um, copies or um, ask, you know they can print their own copies when needed. Um, for folks who work better that way, right? Not everyone is going to interact with the text in the same way, but the idea is at some point they're going back to engage with those annotations and to engage with their peers to learn from each other. Um, it, where they enter that is based on their own, again, learning process and their own um, the reading functions, which is different for everyone. Amanda, question for you then about the role social annotation might play in you know, as you sort of said, the spectrum of various neuro, uh, of neurodiversity, right? Um, does it enable across the spectrum or is it pushing for a certain kind of focus or, because it seems to me like it could be used to mark every time the word red is mentioned um, to find the basketball, I guess it were, but it also does enable whatever your wormhole is to, or, you know, other observations because it's, do you think, do you feel like it takes a stand or not stand, but does it direct in any way as a technology or is it pretty open in terms of allowing for different types of people to see and, or is that really depending on how the, it's framed for, for the students by the teacher? Yeah, I do think it's how it's framed, but I also think in general, we've, we've in academia, we privilege the written text, right? We, we certainly privilege the alphabetic text. Um, so, I also try to give my students other forms of uh, reading. So I always give audiobook options for our full texts. Um, I don't have, you know, social annotation for me is often great for a article or a book chapter, but when we're engaging in, in novel length works or longer texts, um, I have students live tweet <laughs> their reading of novels. This fall, you'll see my students live tweeting Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood, right? Um, I have also, again, I offer those audiobook options and I play audiobook chapters in class that we can annotate in other ways. I think giving students text to speech software is, is extremely important. And again, I'm going to say, like a broken record, that the multimodality of hypothesis is key for why I like it because students can bring in videos and images, which I really think helps certain students learn better. Right. If you have that a picture of what Canterbury Cathedral looks like in when you're reading Canterbury Tales, that's going to help readers understand uh, what what they're talking about. And if you have um, actually when, so when my students read that Nicholas Carr article um, about shallow reading, the very first example he gives is of a baby that opens a magazine and tries to like pinch it because they think it's an iPad. Mm -hmm. Right. And so someone found that video and linked to it of the baby doing that. And that's it's a helpful visual cue and you can do that through hypothesis you can offer those other forms of learning engagement i just want to offer a little personal anecdote and then hear from you alan just in terms of your experience of social annotation allowing for a diversity of viewpoints or forms of expression or different types of students to engage i have one uh, that's very resonant for me in my own personal 
teaching history, which was when I was teaching with Genius at high school. Um, and I was, I was suppose I was on the cusp of transitioning from a very traditional pedagogue of uh, English and literature to one that was thinking about things, new tools, but also new pedagogical practices. And I had a student that was not doing very well in my class. Um, she wasn't, you know, writing essays that met the, the standards and she wasn't passing reading quizzes. Um, and we were reading the, the Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, um, which I believe I uploaded illegally to genius.com. Um, so put, take that out of the recording. But um, they were annotating the Bluest Eye. And she went home and she was reading it and it, she was supposed to annotate it. And she came back and she had annotated this one chapter. She had gone onto the Internet um, and she had researched and discovered all these old advertisements for skin whitening cream, a uh, hair straightening cream targeted African-Americans in the early 20th century um, that are the, obviously the deep context of Toni Morrison's novel. And she put them into the margin and connected them to texts. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> I guess somebody is paying attention. I guess somebody has skills that I had not given her a chance to really express herself with until this, we had this uh, the platform to do it where it was the multimodal piece of it. Um, but it was also this idea of like, maybe she, I don't know what she became. Maybe she became a historical archivist because she had this ability to go and find and really interesting stuff online. And so, you know, I thought it was not just the, the, the multimodality, but also the kind of skill that she was demonstrating um, uh, ways of reading, ways of thinking about culture that I had been pretty, you know, uh, uh, blinded in terms of what I was expecting. Um, so to you, Alan, just diversity of students, different types of students, diversity of forms of expression. Have you seen social annotation as a way to um, for students to, to gain voice? Yeah, of course. Or for yeah. Voices to be heard, I should say. They have the voice, voices to be heard. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's it's really, it's really powerful in that way. Um, and I mean, I'm sure all of us have examples of like, um, seeing these conversations take place in annotation form through threaded discussions alongside the text that might not have otherwise happened in person or in the classroom um, because, you know, sometimes students can feel um, a little um, repressed in the classroom if, if, if they don't feel strongly enough that they want to speak out against someone in person um, or for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and again, it might even speak to, um, again, a, a sort of digital age where we might feel more comfortable typing something behind a screen than we do saying it eye to eye to someone. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not meaningful or important for you to be able to say that. So I think that's what the, the text and the annotation tool gives them is that right and ability to say that. And in doing so sort of democratizes the conversation and doesn't just um, de defer to the loudest person in the in the front row or something like that. That's great. Thank you. Um, I have some small questions that I want to have answered uh, that that came up um, in the in the chat. And then um, if there's a question that that you guys have seen that I haven't picked up on because there's all these different channels, I think I'm suffering from a little bit too much information and also very focused on what you guys are saying. Um, please push me and say, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to bring this one to to have a, as a conversation piece. Um, but uh, so there are a couple of things came up in the courses of your presentation, and they, they also came up in, in some comments in the, in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, Amanda uh, does a kind of completion check. Is that right for in terms of grading annotations? Alan, do you have you graded annotations? Is it a formal like rubric kind of thing or is it uh, sort of complete, incomplete or just, you know, for good vibes, or the, uh, how do you assess social no, annotation, or what were your thoughts I, on assessment? I, I've used it differently for different courses. I, you know, graduate students are, are very different than freshmen. I've done the thing where we're requiring a certain number of annotations, and and just like requiring replies in a discussion board, I think you kind of get like junk replies, and you're just kind of checking the box and doing that. So I tend to leave it a little bit more open ended. Um, but I do give them a sense of like engagement score, which, um, again, I'm not counting annotations on the text, uh, but I am looking at how, how often 
you're interacting with the text and what those interactions look like. Are they just affirming? Are they just saying, I agree, or are they substantive? And if it's a consistent substantive annotation interaction with the text, then I would give it a high engagement score. And that's just one score that I use. Um, it's not per assignment. It's really through the whole course, um, just basically their engagement with the texts. Coming back to you, Amanda, you can say more about assessment, but I also want to use what Alan was saying to point to draw something out from your presentation. Um, you also had a different way of saying, like, it has to be substantive. It has to contribute to the, the learning of the community. Um, talk to me about assessment, but also, like, that seems tough. I mean, do you have a rubric for that to sort of say, did people learn or do you have a, okay, talk to us about that. Yes, and this, a full credit to my colleague at Stevenson, um, uh, Christina Garcia. So this is called the probe rubric, um, and you can use it for like traditional participation, like like in-class participation, that thing that no one really knows how to grade because it's amorphous and strange, right? But you can also use it for online or asynchronous participation. So what the probe rubric looks like, and again, it's, it's linked in the chat <laughs> right there. Um, what this is, is essentially something that I create with my students. So think about contract grading or other forms of collaborative grading models that lots and lots of experts have talked about. Um, this basically asks students to define what they think it should mean to, to have um, respectful, open, brave, and educational uh, contributions. So what does it mean to exceed? What does it mean to meet? Or what does it mean to, to fail to do that effectively? And if you make this rubric with your students, right, if they're actively, oh, sorry, I will relink it, I promise. Um, if you're actively building this rubric together, then they're coming up with the barometer of success. If they're actively contributing to the standard of success, then they know whether they're meeting it or not, right? When they write their annotations. And I also have them do a self-assessment twice a semester. So at um, midway to midterms and midway to finals, right? They assess their own um, contributions, right? Do they think that they were successful in meeting this standard in the pro rubric? Why or why not? And sometimes those are brutally honest, right? Like they say like, no, I have not been contributing because, you know, my dad had COVID and I was working three jobs and, you know, fine, good. I see you and I hear you and that's okay. That's why it's just a check mark or not a check mark, right? But also, Sometimes they say, you know, um, you thought maybe that the student wasn't really doing their best and they articulate that really it was like their best effort, but they were just confused or lost or felt intimidated by some of the other comments of their fellow students. Good information to know as well, right? To help them feel um, equal and seen and heard in the classroom space. So um, I guess it's what I'm trying to say is, is democratize the grading process too, right? Let the students be a part of assessing their own work and have them articulate what they think they're contributing to class in their own terms and learn from them what they think is valuable. Amazing. Um, Alan, there was a question about, do students have a sense, it's from uh, my friend Reed at Pima, do students have a pretty clear sense of what will constitute a high engagement score, Alan? Um, I give them uh, student examples. So some from previous courses, I'll do like an actual PDF of a version of a text with the um, annotations alongside of it, just for them to be able to not just see the number, but um, what kinds of quality I'm looking for in the responses and what kinds of things they can say. And I mean, asking questions counts, you know, I mean, you can, you can ask questions. That's absolutely um, fair. Uh, I just, I give them a model so that they don't think that they have to go through every two lines and say, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Or no, I, you know, um, and, and I think maybe that's where it might get a little bit, um, challenging with, uh, mental effort and things, if that's what you're constantly focused on. Um, so yeah, they just work off of a student model, but it's a very, very low grade, first of all. Um, and really it's for engagement more than anything. So I think another one of the perennial questions, aside from to grade or not to grade uh, annotations, and I think there's a very complicated answer to that here, which is great. I love comp uh, complicating things, is to annotate or not to annotate as the teacher. Um, and Alan, you talked about uh, prompts and being part of the and, and annotating. Um, so I want you to talk a little bit more about that um, and how you pre-populate a text with annotation. And then, Amanda, I'd be here, interested to hear your thoughts on um, whether you pre-populate uh, or whether you're also engaged, you know, with, you know, responding to students' annotations. 
Because I've heard teachers, some say like, I'm, I'm there, I'm modeling, I'm prompting, uh, I'm sort of emceeing the reading to some extent. Um, and then I've heard others that just like step back. I'm, I, I don't play a part. I let this be a student space. Yeah, I, I like that. I, I like that phrase, emceeing the text. I think that's a good way of putting it. I, I tend to lean more towards facilitator um, and drawing them towards things. But as far as the like metacognitive prompting and things, that's more or less um, asking them um, questions like, um, are you understanding this or did you get that? Or um, this is a somewhat uh, difficult um, idea to understand. Here's a supplemental resource or something like that. Uh, I, I know w when you get into like actually embedding questions and using inline questioning, like what's called adjunct questioning, the research is really, really, really kind of furry on, um, on that as far as like whether or not that's actually doing any good as opposed to um, doing a de delayed kind of questioning model. Um, so I tend not to actually embed questions that measure like comprehension within the text, um, but I'll ask them questions along the lines of, you know, are you, are you distracted right now? Or, um, you know, things like that, but to, to very, very minimally, I don't, I try not to overwhelm the text because what we saw in the, in the dissertation research was that if you do that too often, it actually turns students off from the text and it actually starts to negatively impact comprehension. Man. So um, I always start with those general guidelines, um, which I, I'm just going to get one more time just in case. So um, I give them examples of what would make a good annotation. So a summary or paraphrase, a definition, references, opinions, questions, or links to related material. So they always have that prompt. And that prompt you know, is on Blackboard with every single assignment I post with anno with for annotation. Right, so it's reiterated again and again and again. So they kind of know what kind of what kind of annotations I, I think might be helpful. Um, I always then, for the very first assignment, let them go. I let them annotate. I do not interject unless someone asks a specific question of me in the annotations. Right, sometimes it's like, hey, like I don't understand what this means. Can you help, professor? Right. <laughs> sometimes you will get called out like that. In the annotations, um, or sometimes I will see like a, a, an incorrect definition, right? Like someone has linked to the incorrect definition of a word or an incorrect reference, which of course I step in to correct because you don't want then everyone in the class thinking that it's right. Um, so I will step in in those ways. I will also step in if there's inappropriate behavior happening. So I did once have like one student hitting on another student in the comments. Like one student was like, hey, add me on Snap. And then the other person was like, nah, like, you know, that's not supposed to be happening <laughs> in the annotations. So I will step in if there's an appropriate behavior and I'll bring that into the classroom space. Um, I will often also, if there's like a really heated or heavy, like a, a debate that seems to be verging on aggressive, sometimes step in and say, hey, we'll talk about this more in class, right? Just to kind of bring it to a close. And then, like I said, I will screenshot those interesting insights. I will screenshot the most vibrant debates and I bring them into my slides that I start the class with. So I start every class with examples of their annotations. And I then model that good behavior of saying, I found this really interesting because here's links to further research. Here's further definitions. Here's other information that might help you um, continue that conversation in a respectful way. So I do interject and I do, um, you know, engage with their comments, but not actually in the annotation space, but in the classroom space, um, whether whatever that looks like. And I've done this both in online, fully online classes and in fully in-person classes. Um, it also kind of gets they get like the gold star of being student of the week. That's you know, their, their annotations were shared on the board and the student and the, you know, the instructor was giving them that, that highlight, right? I was like signal boosting. I was upvoting, right? Their work um, <laughs> through the slides by showing them. And I, of course, make sure I try to rotate whose, whose comments are being kind of highlighted. Um, and that's not hard to do because you have students who respond differently to different articles, right? Um, but then I, they, I, what I find is after that first time that I do it, where I have the interesting insights and I'm providing several slides worth of further information and opening up the discussion, 
that then in the next annotation assignment, they start doing that as well, right? They provide the links to further research. They start mimicking kind of what I do had done in the class in their own mm -hmm. annotations. So that's the way that I model the behavior, but I do, I never embed specific questions. I never like, plant <laughs> kind of prompts throughout or anything like that. I really let it be their space so that I know what they're thinking about without me leading them down a certain direction. Yeah, I think there's different teaching contexts. And so, you know, the, the one great thing about it is the flexibility of the tool. And um, and that's that's something I definitely love about it. Um, I'm going to address a question that's a couple questions that's come up a couple times in the chat and then run around things out. I just loved Amanda, how you were talking about you were using the language of social. There's some skepticism, I think, a few of the Q&As and, and chats around is hypothesis social media, is social annotation social media. It doesn't have this button or it doesn't have this kind of element of immediate gratification. It's it's got it's missing some pieces of what, say, Twitter, Facebook or whatever they use nowadays is is uh, is using. Um, but I loved how you actually sort of took that in a direction of saying, well, OK, it doesn't have an upvote button. Right. But there's other ways of an upvote button is the simplest way of being sort of like honored for your thinking or honored for your contributions. And uh, if you're pulling annotations into a slide and then talking about those annotations, you're getting the same, you know, it may not be the immediate dopamine. I think somebody used in the in the Q&A of uh, upvote on a social media platform, but it is also training us and making us think about those types of gratifications in over longer periods of time and in different formats. Anyway, you can address that uh, if you want, but I just wanted, since with three minutes left, I'll give each of you a final minute and 30 seconds, I guess exactly each, <laughs> to just share anything from the chat that came up that, you, that hasn't gotten addressed or just, you know, your closing. Uh, I didn't get to talk about this, but this is one of my, you know, thoughts on this topic. And uh, let's start with, uh, with you, Alan. Any, any closing remarks or thoughts? Oh man, I mean, <laughs> This is such a fascinating topic, and I love I love these conversations. And they, these are really valid questions and great um, discussions to have. And I, I just posted that I think hypothesis is more of a uh, tool for discourse, much more so than social media, which is based in immediate gratification and um, doing and saying things for likes rather than for a valid response to that statement. I think, um, and I think that's the big differentiator between between the two. And so I think hypothesis can really foster that kind of conversation, um, whereas social media is more of a sort of um, posturing um, or even or even signaling to others as opposed to hmm. uh, an exchange of ideas. Amanda, your final thoughts or thoughts on social media and social annotation and So I just want to remind everyone that social annotation is just one of the tools in your toolkit. Right. It's um, it's not the right tool for every assignment. It's not the right tool for every kind of engagement. It is one specific kind of tool that I think works really well for close reading. But as I said before, I actually do have students live tweet their readings of novels. I do use social media in the classroom. I have had students make, you know, Instagram in influencer videos about Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale before. Right. Like I think you can use social media. You can use Goodreads. You can use all of these different tools in our toolkit for different kinds of responses from students. Um, what I like about hypothesis is that the skills that they learn in this more safe, more regulated, more academic space can then transfer to those social media spaces where the context and audience is different. But we hope that the skills that they've learned through the kinds of engagement we're promoting will maybe make the internet a better place for everyone. No, I mean, that's too optimistic, right? But I mean, really, isn't that no, part of what we want? <laughs> is what we want to model like kind of good online behavior and, and like thoughtful, educated responses to people's comments and, and um, not just liking things, but but having more substantive um, conversation. But I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm very happy to be that optimistic. I'm not saying it's going to happen every single time, but like, you know, when I was in grad school and they're like, you're teaching in this composition department, it's like composition is what makes engaged citizens and thoughtful citizens. And it was like at the bottom of the pedagogy, you know, the base of the pedagogy for, you know, these courses. And I was like, OK, maybe. But if you start to use these adjacent technologies and uh, there's some slippage between them, I think um, I think that it might be true because it's not writing a five page essay. I don't think a five page essay is necessarily going to prove, you know, to make great engaged 
uh, you know, citizens, but using tools that, as Amanda's point out again and again, hypothesis, one of its great uh, virtues is it's not disposable. It is not an another ed tech tool that gets thrown out at the end of a, of a course or a, when somebody graduates or leaves a, a school. You can use it beyond. Um, maybe more on that in other sessions. Uh, I have not taken a sip of water, checked my phone, or drank a, a sip of my coffee, uh, or done anything but take notes and listen uh, in this conversation. I just want to thank you both so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I could keep going. Uh, maybe we'll have another opportunity to do this. But Alan, Amanda, truly wonderful session. I'm going to echo our keynote speaker that you can reach out anytime. My info is on the um, slides that I provided. Um, I'm on Twitter, obviously, and lots of other places. So reach out anytime. So oh, hi, Ellen. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Go to the, I think you can click back to the table of contents or the schedule and you can jump to the next session. The next sessions will start in, I think, 15 minutes, if I'm correct. Um, and that will be the, the final session, final hour and a half session. We have one uh, sharing stories from the classroom, uh, CTL directors and, and, uh, and staff sharing stories of, of instructors who have uh, their stories from their schools. And we have another session on sort of the avant-garde of integrations with tools like Hypothesis in terms of some publisher and library uh, platforms that Hypothesis is working with. So if you're a sort of interoperability uh, tool geek, go to that latter session. And if you want more ideas about how to use this in the classroom, uh, go to the CTL uh, session and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everybody.